So we have talked about the hallmark finding. What about murmurs? There is, will be no shunt murmur in AST because the pressure gradient is too little. Flow murmurs may sometimes be heard. There are two types of flow murmurs which are heard. First is the mid diastolic murmur which is heard in the tricuspid region and the tricuspid valve region which will be heard best in the lower left sternal border. Then you will have a ejection systolic murmur at the pulmonary wall. This will be usually heard in the upper to middle left sternal border. Right? And flow murmurs are usually heard in large hemodynamically significant ASTs. Now, there is a very important potential MCQ point that Nelson mentions. Nelson 21st edition says that any patient who has a mid diastolic murmur in AST. So, presence of mid diastolic murmur in AST indicates it is a hemodynamically significant AST with QP by QS ratio equal to or more than 2 ratio 1. So, whenever a mid diastolic murmur is heard in ASD, it means the QP stands for pulmonary flow, QS stands for systemic flow. The pulmonary flow is more than double the systemic flow. It is a candidate for surgery or device closure in these patients. So, presence of mid diastolic murmur is not a good sign. It always indicates a severe form of atrial septal defect. So, these are the features of ostium secundum ESD that you need to remember. You need to understand that most of the VSDs, uh, they are silent in the first 4 to 6 weeks. So, VSD will be silent in the neonatal period. Why? Because the pulmonary vascular resistance is still high and so the left to right shunt is not significant enough to produce features, right? What is the time of presentation, time of manifestation or time of age of presentation? Most of the VSDs which are significant, they present between 6 to 8 weeks of age. Some books give a range of 6 to 10 weeks, right? What are the types of presentations you can find? Patients who are having small sized VSDs, they are usually asymptomatic, but on auscultation, you will find a loud, harsh, holosystolic or a pan-systolic murmur. Growth abnormalities, CCF, feeding difficulties, they may not be very prominent in these patients. On the other hand, there in patients who have moderately large or a large VSD, they will have features of congestive cardiac failure developing. They will have recurrent infections happening. Recurrent pneumonias will be common in them because of increased pulmonary blood flow. They will have features of failure to thrive and they will have feeding difficulties. When you take history, you take the history of uh, sweating on forehead while feeding and suck rest suck cycle. So extensive diaphoresis is also one of the described features of VSDs, large VSDs, right? Large VSDs, the murmur, instead of being, the murmur is holosystolic, but it becomes blowing, less loud than harsh. So, rather than being harsh, it becomes blowing and less loud compared to a small VSD. So, these are the clinical manifestations that you will find. The manifestations will be slightly different in case of late preterm or term babies. So, term babies or those coming to attention late, they will have either a silent PDA. Silent PDA can remain undiagnosed for many months or sometimes there have been reports where it has been diagnosed beyond a year of life or they may become clinically manifested. The clinical manifestations will include Congestive cardiac failure, failure to thrive, pneumonias, etc. 
what are the signs you will find of PDA? First of all, the, you will find that there is a hyperactive precordium. So, hyperactive precordium will be present. Secondly, you will find that there are bounding pulses. The reason for bounding pulses, I have already told you, they occur due to wide pulse pressure. Thirdly, there will be a continuous machinery murmur, which is the hallmark murmur seen in these individuals. Sometimes, if the diastolic component is faint, you can also appreciate a flow murmur. Continuous machinery murmur will usually be best audible in the second left intercostal space. Flow murmur will be a type of mid-diastolic murmur produced at the mitral wall due to increased flow across that wall. And you will find features of CO2 retention. Many of these patients, especially preterm newborns, can also develop low urine output. Because the left to right shunt is large and so you may find significant reduced flow in the descending aorta and uh, many times kidneys tend to suffer because of fall in the renal blood flow which can produce a pre-renal type of injury causing low urine output. This usually responds to hemodynamic measures as well as uh, medical closure which is tried in these individuals. So these are the signs. Coarctation of aorta, when you do auscultation, you will find that many of these patients will have a ejection systolic murmur. In the third or fourth intercostal space near the left sternal wall. This will be due to narrowing, turbulence being produced in that area. And as I had said that 70% patients are found to have a bicuspid aortic valve also. So those who are having bicuspid aortic valve, these children will additionally show the presence of ejection clicks. So this is a potential MCQ point. Presence of ejection clicks in coarctation of aorta indicates what? It indicates presence of underlying bicuspid aortic wall. By itself, bicuspid aortic wall is usually silent. What are the signs in tetralogy of fallow? First of all, you will find that when S1, the first heart sound will be found to be normal in most of these patients. The second heart sound is usually found to be single. Why single? Only A2 component is heard. In case of mild tetralogy of fallow, the P2 component is very faint, inaudible, whereas in moderate to severe TOF, due to decreased pulmonary blood flow and decreased flow across the pulmonary wall, the P2 is inaudible. And so practically what we hear is only A2 in these patients. Talking about murmurs, do you hear a murmur? Yes, we do. There is no shunt murmur in tetralogy of fallow. But the murmur we hear in these patients is ejection systolic murmur. It is usually heard in the left, across the left sternal border. Across the left sternal border it is heard. And we usually, Park talks about that in case of infundibular stenosis, it is usually heard on the lower aspects of the sternal border, whereas in case of uh, purely valvular stenosis, it is slightly higher placed. But this is something which is more academic and on auscultation, all we hear is ejection systolic murmur. Some of these patients may have ejection clicks, but ejection clicks, they are plus or minus, they may or may not be present. Murmurs that you find in mitral regurgitation, the classic murmur, the hallmark murmur that we find in these patients is a holosystolic or a pan-systolic murmur. This pan-systolic murmur is best heard at the apex and it radiates to axilla. In addition, you may also find a flow murmur because D during diastole, 
there may be a functional constriction which may be produced. So, it will be producing a, see extra amount of blood has gone into left atrium. That entire extra amount when it will try to pass through the uh, mitral valve, normal mitral valve, it will cause during diastole a flow murmur. So, during diastole you may find a diastolic rumbling murmur in some of these patients. In addition, you can also find S3 gallop rhythm in a good number of these individuals. So, S3 gallop rhythm, particularly if CCF is going to develop, you will find developing in these patients. Now, what is the murmur that we find in mitral stenosis? When will murmur appear? When blood tries to move from left atrium to left ventricle through the narrow opening and blood will move during what phase? Diastole. So, you will find a diastolic murmur. So, it is a long, low-pitched, rumbling, diastolic murmur. The hallmark of this murmur is that there is late diastolic or pre-systolic accentuation at the apex. Just before systole begins, just before S1, the intensity of the murmur will slightly increase. This is a very useful clue because many other murmurs which are diastolic, they don't show pre-systolic accentuation. This point helps you in knowing that this is surely the murmur of mitral stenosis. As disease progresses, you find that there is dyspnea on exertion and orthopnea also developing. Angina may happen on heavy exercise because uh, the left ventricle systolic dysfunction does not allow the BP, the systolic BP, it is already elevated and it cannot arise beyond a certain point. It will produce cardiac pain in the patient because as you know that flow into the coronary arteries usually occurs during diastole. And since the diastolic output is relatively less, so angina on heavy exercise may sometimes be seen. However, it is more common in adults as compared to children. So, this is one point that you can even skip during uh, preparing for your super speciality pediatric exam. And what is the type of murmur that we find? We find a murmur, potential MCQ, high pitched diastolic decrescendo murmur. Decrescendo means intensity goes coming down. So, it is best audible at the third or fourth left intercostal space and it is the auscultatory hallmark of these patients.